You may have recently been having some thoughts and feelings about how we as people relate to and interact with one another. And yes, we live in a society, so it's no wonder that some people have asked the question, do humans behave like a superorganism? I liked this question when one of you posted it, especially because I'm so interested in how people interact and how sociality works in nature. I'd like to start laying the groundwork for our discussion of this question by outlining a few definitions. An organism, as you might be aware, can be defined as a single united system of life. An organism can be a single-celled creature like an amoeba or a complex multicellular creature like you and me. We count as organisms because even though we're made up of trillions of individual cells all doing different jobs, those cells are dependent on one another for survival, so together they make up one living organism. Eusocial is a fancy word that means truly social, and it's used to describe certain animals with complex social systems. While zebras might live together in a herd and lions are organized into prides, these social systems still leave lots of room for individual variation. On the other hand, animals like naked mole rats and ants have incredibly complex social systems, which earn them the designation of eusocial. A eusocial animal group usually organizes itself into a colony, with one or a few reproductive animals, and then many other individuals who are responsible for doing the work of keeping the colony safe and fed. With those terms in mind, we can now focus in on the idea of superorganisms. I'm not an expert on this topic by any means, but luckily the internet is full of cool scientists, so I was able to find this amazing expert. So I am, I'm Greg Pask. I, am in, uh, I use he, him pronouns. I am an assistant professor at Middlebury College up in Middlebury, Vermont, and I am an insect neurobiologist who works with ants. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. What is a superorganism? So a, a superorganism, I like to think about it, um, I like to talk about it um, to those who aren't familiar with this term and that it's kind of like every single, you know, ant or bee or, you know, other, you know, whatever species you're thinking about is kind of like a cell in a part of a larger multicellular organism of the colony. So if we take an ant colony, that every single ant in that colony is the superorganism and then every single uh, individual um, organism within that is like a cell within that larger thing. And they all have different roles. You may think of the term hive mind when you hear about superorganisms. With all of those moving parts, how do the individuals performing those roles know what to do? And that's actually kind of where my research like focuses and like the, the communication strategies. How do these individuals within this superorganism colony, how are they able to communicate? And it's definitely not through spoken language like us. Oftentimes it's chemical. Sometimes you have other aspects of communication that really work. Like the, the waggle dance in honeybees is a very popular um, example of how they're using their own sort of language to, to communicate these really complex um, instructions and you know, information to each other. Social learning can take place in the colony and out of the colony, um, especially when you go on kind of group, group foraging bouts. Um, ants do a thing where it's like tandem running. So like one ant that knows where it's going will make a couple steps forward and the other ant will follow it and touch its, you know, touch its abdomen and then it'll keep moving. And they'll just kind of do this like tandem run to find this resource. You know, learning takes place anytime you have multiple social organisms together. Well, we certainly have multiple social organisms working together in our human society. And I'm sure we can all agree a lot of different kinds of communication and learning are present in our society too. So let's get right down to the main question here. Do humans act like a superorganism? In some places, humans look a lot like a superorganism. And, it, and it's really interesting to think about where we have some, you know, some superorganisms, you have their, their only task, like this big distribution of labor that occurs. So some individuals will specialize in taking care of the young. We have daycare systems as humans. We have um, nannies. We have any sort of child care providers, school systems, right? There's a lot of learning that goes on in the larval stages of these um, superorganism colonies. So yeah, you get a lot of that specialization. There's other ones that go out foraging, right? most of us don't grow our own food, right? And I, I think it'd, you'd be hard pressed to say that walking around your supermarket is foraging. <laughs> so we have, you know, certain individuals can contribute 
certain aspects to our larger society. You, you also have some people that take advantage of the masses by the thing that they contribute, um, which you can also find some nice parallels to the, you know, the insect superorganism world. Wait, so even selfish people who don't seem to be contributing to the functioning of our society share similarities with these insects? How can there be cheaters in a superorganism? You can have a lot of mutiny that can occur in a, in a superorganism. So like, Especially if, it's for some reason, the queen's reproductive abilities is is waning, right? If she's not producing eggs too much at that at a high clip or a high enough clip, all of a sudden you might have workers that start to lay their own eggs. Like in bumblebees is a classic example here, where you have a lot of the workers that are starting to lay their own eggs will like attack the queen and kill their own queen to then. Hopefully, you know, they'll lay these eggs that will, you know, produce males and they've kind of spread their genes elsewhere. It gets vicious and it's savage for a, for a good stretch of time until all of a sudden you get, you know, colonies forming elsewhere. Maybe that colony doesn't persist. It's, it's the last ditch and like they're just sending out elsewhere and they're, you know, that colony's time is over. But hopefully it led to maybe, you know, you know more than one colony elsewhere and all of a sudden you get an increase in the, you know, their overall fitness. Okay, but it sounds like cheaters can be really harmful to a superorganism, which makes a lot of sense. So are there ways for a colony to control or prevent cheaters? Greg mentioned all of the chemical communication a queen can do to keep her colony in line. And sometimes it's behavioral suppression too. So like if one tries to cheat the system, all of a sudden other workers will smell that and be like, you're not, you're not the queen, you're not our queen. And they'll like, grab her bite her sometimes they'll like grab and like walk around with her for like a day i've seen it like 24 hours where this queen is constantly being policed and carried around and i'll be like taking care of them be like oh this must be a dead end let me like remove this one and i open the open the nest box and all of a sudden they kind of just like both walk their separate ways and be like nope we're all good here i'm like i thought you were dead but you were just getting policed cheater so cheating can be bad for the superorganism colony, and cheating can also earn an individual some punishment. If that's the case, then why are there cheaters? It can be evolutionarily you know, advantageous to, to cheat and to send your own genes into that system. We, we see this in a lot of different um, you know, species across all of, you know, a lot of animals and other things as well, where they, if they cheat the system, they get an advantage. Yeah, that unfortunately sounds pretty similar to human society too. It feels like there are a lot of parallels between humans and superorganisms. Are there any major differences? The one of the one of the things and that really separates uh, insects from humans, and I think we characterize them as not being super, you know humans not being true superorganisms, is the altruism that comes into play when you think about who is being the reproductive um, individual in that colony. I think it'd be very hard pressed to find people who would give up their own ability to rear, you know, to create and rear offspring as humans. So there's a lot of people who choose not to have kids, but they also probably don't want to take care of somebody else's kids at the same time. So these individuals in superorganism colonies, they are giving up their own right to produce offspring, but they're also taking care of the offspring of one of their relatives. And that is kind of what leads to this really successful um, plan for a lot of these superorganism insects. Okay, so even with all of our similarities, there are some qualities of human society that indicate we don't function exactly like a superorganism. With that in mind, is there anything we can learn from superorganisms? Well, I think I think we could learn so much from them because, like, it's it's a huge sacrifice, and like, it's you're giving you're giving so much towards. Um, you know, towards the success of the whole, as opposed to looking out for yourself. Right? I think there's a nice little lesson there. You can make many motivational posters, be like, "Look to the social insects," uh, and and they and they dominate. They tend to to dominate the planet, and they're very successful in certain ecosystems. They they really run everything. I think effective, clear com communication is one where it's like, you know, for if we're using chemical communication, it's like, hey, it's either here or it's not. There's no, you know, mixed messages. There's you're not trying to read. There's no answer. Like, all right, here's this trail pheromone. Like, is this really something that we like? Are they trying to read between lines? Like, nope. All right, here it comes. Let's let's follow this and lay it down. And there's like a nice, and like every single 
individual, you know, I, I, you know, I'm obviously very interested in ants. So that's where a lot of these examples come from, but they, it's like this chemical democracy that they have where the more food at the end of that, you know, wherever the trail goes, the more they are likely to lay down more pheromones. So it's like, hey, we're laying down a bunch of pheromone and like the more pheromone, the more votes it got. So like, hey, let's go to this food source and it's going to recruit more. And then once it winds down, then there's, then there's less. And I mean, we, there's a lot of ways our democracy can be improved. <laughs> Stronger altruism and more effective communication are definitely things we could work on, yeah. So even though there are a lot of similarities between us and the eusocial insects, there are also a lot of differences. And although we may have focused on some negative examples here, I can think of some very good things about human society operating differently from a superorganism colony, too. I am so grateful to Dr. Pask for speaking to us about superorganisms, but what I was able to share with you here is just a fraction of all of the amazing things he had to say. Since I didn't want this to turn into a 45 minute video, I've just shared the most important clips here, but I've released the complete clips from our conversation over on my Patreon page. If you'd like to support the content I make, the link to my Patreon is down in the video description, and becoming a patron will give you access to all kinds of cool behind the scenes content like this. If you liked this video, don't forget to like it. If you didn't like this video, please share it with someone who would. And if you'd like to support The Roving Naturalist, remember to hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon. You can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Don't forget, you can also find me over on the Nature Check Project playing TTRPGs with other scientists. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.